talking about mitigating climate change with solar power transportation. And to follow along with what Krister just showed, this is a picture of carbon emissions starting in 1960, from 1966 and going on every 10 years or so. And we see that carbon emissions have been on the increase just as he was explaining a minute ago. Now the IPCC, the Internet, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that our remaining carbon budget is about another 200 billion tons. But I got news for you. Mother Nature doesn't really care about our silly round numbers. And this was a fire that took place in Alberta a while back and uh, had devastating effects. And we're seeing more and more of those. There was a fire in the wintertime in Norway a couple years ago. What's going on here? Well, climate change is going to affect Silicon Valley. And if the size of the, of the uh, increase in the sea level is only a half a meter, we'll see something like this. Go back again. So this is what it looks like now. That's only a half a meter. That's where all these high-tech companies are. Google, Facebook, Yahoo, uh, some of the old ones too, like Lockheed Martin have a big facility there. This is what one meter looks like, two meters, and three meters. So, guess what? If Silicon Valley stopped using carbon immediately and became perfect, guess what? We would have 0.04% of the world population tuned up and ready to come on and deal with climate change. So if you techies are serious, you guys from Silicon Valley and me included, if you're serious about climate change, your only answer is to start exporting good answers. All right? This is what it's going to look like in Antwerp. There it is now. That's with just, what is that? One meter. Comes right up to you. Two meters, three meters. Doesn't change all that much. But again, if you become perfect and you stop using carbon altogether, you're still 0.1% of the world population. It's not going to work unless you guys from Belgium start exporting good answers and solutions to the rest of the world. Sweden, right across the way from Copenhagen. See what's happening to Copenhagen here? And this is a close-up of Malmö in Sweden. It's the city that I looked at that seemed to be the closest to sea level, and that's with three meters. If Sweden became perfect, it's one-tenth of one percent of the human population, and so your only answer is to start exporting solutions. Now, sustainability requires a significant and rapid change in the nature and the magnitude of what people do. And this picture shows how it, there's a kind of a well into which the stability of the planet's climate system operates. But there's a possibility that because of this great acceleration, it will reach a new point of stability. Now, it may drop back down into a <coughs> form that's tolerable for humans, but we go up there, we're in uncharted territory. But we're lucky to know that last year, in December, November, December, the conference of the parties, the United Nations, got together and they came up with an urgent call for renewables. And, you know, it's looking pretty promising. There's a bunch of companies, there's a bunch of small, smaller government entities, smaller than nations, like cities and counties and states, uh, provinces, that are coming on board. And world leaders appear to be getting ready for going to a solar future. What they concluded at the Paris talks was that solar energy, renewable energy in general, was our solution. But how fast do we have to change? And just because our illustrious leaders shake hands doesn't mean that we're going to be there. And then furthermore, we have detractors. Yes, but. Here's one of the experts in uh, thermodynamics who says that these are intermittent sources. Renewable energy is intermittent. Uh, there's a guy, 1453, right? I think that's when it was. Uh, dude, where have you been? <laughs> okay, 
Au contraire, Mr. Bill Gates, it's fossil fuels that are agotable. The word in Spanish for depleting, I really like, because it means it will turn into just little drops. It'll become, uh, gota means drop in Spanish. So we can see that these fossil fuel resources are going to go into decline, but it gets kind of interesting when you look at countries which have been exporting fossil fuels. And I call these countries the ones that used to export oil and now they're importing, those are the X to M countries. And what happens is that their demand goes up. And as their demand goes up, their exports come down. Let's look at the list. Started out, of course, with the United States many years ago, but then in 1993, China went from an exporter to an importer. A couple of years later, Peru in 1996 went to uh, an importer. Indonesia. Remember all those riots they had in Indonesia? What was that all about? Well, guess what? It was about oil. And the UK became an exporter. I mean, well, it was an exporter temporarily. Um, I could tell you a lot more about that. They have a lot more people in Norway. Norway and the UK started out with about the same amount of oil, but there's, what is it, 60 million people in the UK and 5 million in Norway. So it's a very different story when you go to becoming an importer again after you redesigned your whole society around the automobile, driving around in your Jaguar. I don't know what it's going to be like. Egypt. Remember Arab Spring? Yes. What did I say yesterday? I said, you've got to look under the surface and figure out what the physics are. And the physics of Arab Spring was peak oil. Not only that, but the point at which they went under financially because they stopped exporting oil. Mubarak stopped having money to pay off all of his political enemies. And now look what's going on. Syria. Argentina. Watch out for Argentina. They're shaky to begin with. They're shaker now that they're past that point again. And Yemen. A basket case. So the X to M club has many distinguished members and there are others lining up to join this club and watch out. One country after another is using up its seed corn. And I want to go back a minute talk a little more about one of these countries, Syria. In 2002 they reached peak and only took nine years for them to go from peak production to becoming an importer. And you know what happened then. The wheels fell off their whole economy. But there was more to it than that. There are these rivers that are famous from antiquity that start out in another country right next door. And guess what? That country next door started building a bunch of dams a few years ago. So the water supply deteriorated in Syria. People started moving to cities. And look what we've got. Same thing is happening in, Sy in uh, Yemen. Same thing will probably happen in many other countries seems to be that people leave the city, uh, leave the country and go to the city. So there's a point, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Yet those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> well now, transportation consumes about a third of commercial energy, the kind we produce. And we're looking at uh, the seed corn is not what it's cracked up to be because there's people playing around even with our seeds and one kind of a seed that is looking pretty 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 dicey now is this one okay we use oil to go see our lovely national forests and and go to the Galapagos and turn around but we're using ugly ugly fossil fuels our seeds are getting cornier and one option might be the Toyota Carolla. <laughs> Another one might be the Dong Car. But if you're not enthusiastic about those solutions, take a look at Swenson's Law. You know, I've see, everybody seems to have a law these days. And I thought, well, if, if Einstein and, and uh, what's that guy's name, Isaac Newton can have a law, so can Ron Swenson. And what I basically say is, these are the options we have. As demand goes up, we either have to conserve or we have to change our lifestyle, which means you don't go visit grandma on Saturday like you used to, or we put in something else. We substitute 
or guess what? Your other option is deprivation. <coughs> so we can either put our heads in the sand or we can employ our technology for mutual well-being. And here we got another yes but. Uh, the industry is hard to decarbonize. I sat next to this turkey, uh, this fine fellow, uh, <laughs> Jeffrey Sachs, at a meeting uh, in Silicon Valley a few years ago. He seemed to be quite full of himself. He, he does make recommendations to the, uh, you know, to the head of the United Nations. He's on this economic advisor group. And he says industry is hard to decarbonize. Well, I got news for you. There are people who are going to work on this. And what Robert Heinlein, he wrote uh, Stranger in a Strange Land and a lot of other fine science fiction books that I read when I was a kid. He said, always listen to the experts. They'll tell you what, you can't, what can't be done and why. Then do it. So one industry is doing it. And that's SSAB Swedish Steel Octibolog Carbon Dioxide Free, free Steel Industry. And they had a hearing, I mean, a, a press release in uh, April, and that's the Vice President for Communications, the CEO. But also, interestingly, he brought along a couple of his peers uh, from um, LKAB and from Vattenfall. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the Minister of Enterprise showed up. But here's the interesting thing. The head of Vattenfall, which has been a big pusher for coal and nuclear, they're, they're very heavy in, in uh, all around Europe in <coughs> producing electricity. And he said, renewables, not nuclear. So they are catching on even. So I say we wake up to the power of solar. And I did some math a while ago. I want to go through this quickly. And now others are starting to do the math and to figure out how we go about doing this. A recent article provides some very detailed calculations to show just how we could get there from here. But we've got to get moving. And the only real question left is how much money it's going to cost. But whether it costs a lot or a little, we've got to change our way of thinking about things. And of course, pod cars would be a natural solution. Two minutes, thanks. Yeah. Uh, a natural solution to this dilemma. But we've had a bit of trouble getting traction. So I wonder what we might do differently. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And instead of pointing fingers at everybody else, uh, what we've been doing in Silicon Valley, and, and Eric, uh, who's coming up after me, and Professor Furman, going to talk about what we're doing about this in Silicon Valley. And the thing is that if we want to find a way to the future that's a better future, the way to predict that future is to design it. So we're busy designing it. This is what it looks like. Solar energy offers pod cars a powerful tool to mitigate climate change and build a viable future. And this is what I'm telling you all here, that maybe what it's going to take for us to get these technologies out into the marketplace is not just look at congestion, not just look at better transportation in and of itself, but also look for a carbon neutral solution which is going to be much harder to scale up using other techniques. So autonomous vehicles might do the trick, but what happens when we flip the tables on just the old autonomous vehicle? Uh, whoops, let's see. Hmm. Uh, uh, there, how's that? <laughs> and look what we might get in the bargain. So it isn't just about making a better transportation system, it's also livening up our cities. And by having elevated systems, for example, I think we can make a difference. So we're developing the Solar Skyways Network of Universities. San Jose State has been working on this for four years. We've had students from Sweden, from Korea, from France, from Brazil. And this is the website I'd like you to take down, solarskyways.net, and invite you to join us. How many of you here are from academia? All right. I invite you all to get your students uh, inspired by what uh, is coming next on the program, and we'll go from there. Oh, one last thing. You'll see on this list here, you have a list of the universities to work with, the Spartan Superway, and we have an extensive library of work that the students done, all there for you to absorb and enjoy. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you.